All right, real quick before we get started, hey, I just want to make um, an announcement. Um, it's about meeting together. Uh, like we said last week and Sunday, we're going to continue with the YouTube for a little bit. But we are headed towards meeting in the park. I think the park, it's Meadows Park? Meadows? We're, we're looking into it. We don't know exactly where yet. <laughs> but that's one of the options. Be that as it may be, hey, I just want to encourage you. Maybe you have a heart to help out. Um, maybe with setup, Maybe ushering, something like that. Um, go ahead and, and contact us at the office if you have a heart to serve. Maybe you've been serving and... Uh, you know, you're not interested in serving anymore. You just want to take a break. That's okay. You know, just let us know so we can just create a list of, of uh, potential helpers and volunteers to set up there in the church. Okay, so we have kind of a... Now this chapter ahead of us is so rich. It's so uh, full. There's so much that... Yeah, let's just go ahead and dig in, okay? Let's, let's pray and we'll get started. All right. Father God, not only is it a privilege to worship you, Lord, it's a privilege to hold your word in our hand. Lord, to have your love letter of, of your love for us, the revelation of your heart, Lord, in our hand, the Bible. What a privilege that is. And Lord, I just pray for encouragement right now. Lord, I pray for um, your spirit to reveal to us your heart right now. I just pray as we come together and look into your word, God, you would show us wonderful things in your, in your word. And Lord, that there would be challenges in our hearts, Lord. If we're heading one way or another, like we're straying, Lord, just challenge us to get back on that path. If, if we're just, um, you know, in a place where we don't feel like you're um, too concerned with us, whatever the case. Lord, just bring the encouragement. Bring the encouragement you have to offer your children. Let us look square into your face of love, Lord, your eyes of grace, and just receive from you, Lord. Take us deep into your word now. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. And while you're doing that, you know, I want to remind you that we've actually covered a lot of territory in the last few weeks. From the creation of Adam and Eve now to this chapter, it's 1,600 years. And I want to remind you too, Genesis 4.26, last verse, chapter 4, before we got into the genealogy, we read, And as for Seth, to him also a son was born. And, his, and he named his, uh, him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And you might remember that I commented that this was the first revival recorded in history. There was a resurgence of spirituality. But by the time we get to this chapter, things have gone horribly wrong. No one, it seems, is seeking after the Lord. It appears that nobody has a heart for God. Things are looking very dark. And what that tells me is... Boy, if we're relying on past victories in our lives, man, we're on dangerous ground. There's a serious problem in our life if we look back and we see a time when we were closer to the Lord, maybe more in love with the Lord, doing more for the Lord. I mean, honestly, if we ever look backwards in time and we see a time in our lives where we were, had, a, had greater hearts on fire for the Lord. A time when we were more excited about uh, being in the Bible, more excited about going to church, more excited about um, fellowshipping with other believers. If that's ever true in our lives, then, you know, we're in a backslidden state. Uh, uh, it just, we just need to be honest. I've always thought that walking with the Lord is um, like climbing a greased pole there at the fair. Now, honestly, I've never seen anybody climb a greased pole. I've seen them on some of these old movies, you know. You, you know what I'm talking about, though. Uh, they get a kid or two or 10, whatever. They're there at the county fair. They put a $20 bill, a $50 bill at the top. And they tell the kids, hey, you climb up to the top, you get the money. And so... They get these kids and they start climbing up and everybody, they just get a kick out of seeing these kids trying to get up 
this grease pole. But the thing about the grease pole is this. What I've noticed watching it is you're either going up or you're going down. There's no just staying in one spot. You know, and I think that that's the way it is with the Lord. There's no maintaining uh, ground. We're either going, drawing close to the Lord, or we're going backwards in our walks with the Lord. We're either growing in our love for the Lord, we're going deeper with the Lord, or we're going backwards. And uh, it's not good. And one of the things that made me think about this, of course, is in, early in Jesus' ministry, John chapter 2, he goes in and he cleanses the temple. But then we see three years later at the end of his ministry in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus cleanses the temple again, again. And what it speaks to me about is if we're not on guard, if we're not like I say, going for it with the Lord, then what happens is these stinky, uh, smelly, filthy, bad habits, they just start creeping back in. And it's so very subtle. We need to be on guard. We need to be going with it for the Lord. You know, I hope you have time that you set aside, meaningful time where you're just really seeking after the Lord. You're getting uh, away with the Lord on a regular basis. And, you know, honestly, I, I'm not just saying it to condemn anybody. I'm just telling you where I'm at. You know, I need to meet with the Lord every morning. I need to be in prayer all day long. I need to be in the Word. And, you know, I... Anybody will tell you that's involved in ministry. It's not enough that I study the Word to bring a Bible study to the church. I need to be doing it for me. I need to be in it for me. And, and uh, I just know that's true for me. So what we're about to read here, you know, it happened. Uh, we're about to read what happens when that priority is allowed to slip from our lives. Genesis chapter 1 verses one through four. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff here. We'll try to plow through it. Um, yeah. So now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, you know, we have a strange story before us right now. And, uh, you know, there are a few different ways of looking at this passages and you may have a particular view in regards to this passages, uh, these, these verses. You know, on one hand, what you have are those people that see this as completely human in origin. And they would say that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, spoken in verse 2, that the righteous line of Seth, that's who's being referred to here as the sons of God, and the um, sinful line of Canaan, that's what's being referred to as the daughters of men. And they intermarried, Okay. Uh, it's kind of like they were unequally yoked. Now, they say, and that union produced these giants and mighty men. The problem with that is there's no place in the Bible that says Cain's line, uh, Seth's line was righteous. Okay? I mean, that's something that we place on that line. It doesn't say it in the Bible. We place it <clears throat> on the story. And I think it would be unwise for us. I think it would be unfair for us to think that Everybody from Seth's line was righteous, that they were seeking after God. In fact, the entire world at this time is going to, you know, perish in a judgment of God. The entire world, with the exception of eight individuals, they're going to suffer God's judgment. Seth's line, it does carry the promise of the Messiah, however, but it's not righteous. Right? There's none righteous. No, not one. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, on top of that, another problem with that view, are there kids in Sunday school every Sunday? <laughs> Maybe not the last few Sundays. 
But there are kids, right? You know what I'm talking about. There are kids in Sunday school that they only have one believing parent, right? And I think you'd be hard-pressed if you were to line up all these kids in Sunday school. I think you'd be hard-pressed to be able to identify which child had one believing parent and one unbelieving parent and which kid had two believing parents. I mean, uh, kids, they all come out basically about the same, right? Um, It doesn't matter if you have one believing parent or two believing parents. They all look about the same. And our faith doesn't alter our DNA. So that's a problem. Now, don't misunderstand me with this, okay? We're not to be unequally yoked. As believers, we're not to engage in in a, a situation where we are unequally yoked. And the devil wants us to compromise in that area and all kinds of different areas, you know? He'll say, hey, you know, if you want to be a Christian, okay, just don't be one of those Bible-thumping Christians, you know? Don't be one of those Christians that tell people about Jesus and how he can save them from their sins. And you don't want to look like a weirdo, do you? But you know what, anyway, who are you to say who's a sinner? And I love this, you know, people come up to you all the time. Let him who's without any sin cast the first stone. Uh, You know, every unbeliever, they know Bible verses. That's one of them. The other famous unbeliever Bible verses, judge not lest you be judged. So I don't know. But the devil will say that. Just just go ahead to go along to get along. Just try to fit in, you know, but just don't stand out as a Christian. The problem is this. James 4.4 says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world. And the idea is we're not to be pressed into the mold of the world. We're not to look like everybody else in the world. We're to stand out as believers. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but in contrast to that, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. You know, trying to fit in, trying to look like the rest of the world just makes us an enemy of God. You know, the devil will say, well, hey, guys, there's lots of good things out in the world. Just focus on the good and embrace that. Well, again, 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he goes on in verse 17, John says, And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. As Christians, we're to be separate from the world. Um, we're, We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We're to be salt and light, and we're not to get caught up in in the world and the, uh, the cares of this life so that the seed that's planted in our heart can produce fruit. Now, the other side of the argument of these first verses here in Genesis, uh, people see it as completely spiritual in origin. Uh, they would say the sons of God in verse two, it refers to angelic beings. And three times, and, and this, is, this is where they get it from, Three times, primarily in the book of Job, uh, we see this phrase, but the exact phrase in the Hebrew, three times, shows up in the book of Job, and each time it does refer to angelic beings. And they would say that these fallen angels, they came to earth and they had sex with the daughter of men, and the union produced giants, or literally Nephilim, right? The the problem with this view is that nowhere in the Bible is there any indication at all that angels are sexual beings. The Sadducees, you might remember, they came to Jesus, they came to Jesus mockingly, and they were mocking him because they didn't believe in the resurrection. But they came to Jesus and they said to him, you know, there's this guy here, he got married to a girl, And uh, he ended up dying before she had any kids. So his brother took her as his wife. And before they could have any kids to raise up to the the older brother that already died, you know, the second husband died. So the third brother came and takes her as his wife. He also died, no kids. And, you know, all seven of these brothers had her. So after she dies in the resurrection, Whose wife is she going to be? Go ahead and tell us, Jesus. Let us know. 
What are you thinking? They're trying to pin Jesus down. And it's funny because Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. The people who hold this view, they'll come back at that and say, yeah, just because Jesus didn't say uh, that they don't marry, just because he said, let me correct, just because Jesus said they don't marry doesn't mean they're not sexual beings. To that, I say, come on, man. Get a grip on yourself, will you? I mean, does anyone really think that angels are engaging in sex outside of a covenant of marriage which God gave to man? You think angels are in heaven and heaven is, is more unholy and more sexually orientated than the earth is today? I mean, there's no way. It's just nonsense. Well, these people then they'll point to Jude. They point to Jude 6, 7, which says, And the angel who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting change and under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering vengeance and eternal fire. They'll say, see, there you have it. Just like the angels, Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves over to sexual immorality and strange flesh. There it is. There's the proof text. But I don't think that's the way we should interpret that verse. Actually, what it says is Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these. The comparison is Sodom and Gomorrah did what the angels did. Not that the angels did what Sodom and Gomorrah did. Okay, the angels rebelled against God and they followed Satan. Heaven was their proper domain and their purpose is serving uh, God as ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who inherit salvation. In a similar manner, Sodom and Gomorrah left their proper domain. The angels' proper domain was in heaven. Sodom and Gomorrah's proper domain Man's proper domain is a sexual relationship in the confines of marriage. But they allowed for sexual immorality to just go rampant in rebellion to God. That actually makes more sense to me. Now, people that hold this view that the angels had sex with uh, the daughters of men, they hold this view, they say, they point out the word giant. It means Nephilim. It means fallen ones right? And they'll say the fallen angels, they're trying to destroy uh, humankind by polluting the gene pool. They're trying to thwart God's plan uh, of the promised Messiah by polluting the gene pool and thus producing these monsters, these giants, these monstrosities of men, which is where uh, people would point out, it's probably where the legends of the demagogues and the titans came from. And, you know, uh, I just I just find it funny because, you know, we have phrases today that, you know, he's a giant of a man, you know, um, he's a he's a titan of industry. And nobody in their right mind would think that Andrew Carnegie or J.P. Morgan, Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller, that they're the offspring of demons. I mean, it's just ridiculous. In God's eyes, mankind, they're the fallen one. In God's eyes, if you look how far uh, man has fallen from the creation to this point in time, you know, that's, that just shows us that it's mankind that are fallen. If God was trying to bring the flood, as these people will say, to wipe out uh, this satanic genetic race of men, well, then God didn't do a very good job also because Nephilim and and all kinds of giants show up after the flood, show up in the history of Israel. When Israel came out of Egypt and went there, and uh, it says that um, Israel, Israel fought and defeated Og. He was the king of Bashan. And it says he was a giant. His, his um, bed was 13 feet long. I mean, he was a giant of a man. So, you know, I don't really think that that's the proper interpretation of these verses personally. 
Another problem with the idea of demons having sex with women to pollute this gene pool is that uh, God holds man, not angels, responsible for the act. He says in verse 3, my spirit shall not strive with man. In fact, man is mentioned nine times in a negative light in the first seven verses here of Genesis chapter, chapter 6. So I don't think that this is the proper interpretation. I think that there's a third alternative to this. And I believe that this makes more sense. Of course, whatever view you want to hold, hey, you're welcome to it. Um, but this is what I think it means. I think the sons of God, it's just a way of saying man. And I think the daughters of women, I think that's a way of saying women. You know, the sons of God, I believe, though, were men who were most likely demon possessed. OK, I think what we're reading here is a Old Testament reference to demon possession. And I think that these fallen angels, they looked for men who were the worst of the worst so that they could possess them. They were taller. They were stronger. They were smarter. They were more wicked than anybody else. And they, they sought these guys out to possess them. And then they looked for women who were um, equally tall, strong, smart, and wicked. And what happened then is there's a uh, selective breeding program, so to speak, that goes on so that they could breed people that were more wicked and overrun the world with wickedness and um, the like. And it's not uncommon for human history. I mean, probably the last selective breeding program we saw was in Nazi Germany. You know, so I think that's probably what happened. For me, it all comes down to this, though. For me, this is what's important. Why do we have this story? I mean, are you drawn closer to the Lord thinking that demons have sex with women? Is that the purpose of the, the story? Is that edifying? That's an edifying end of this story? You know, I don't think that's the case. I think the purpose of this story is not so much to tell us specifically the sin that went on. It's not revealing that specific sin. But the purpose of the story is to give us some indication or some clue of the signs and seasons in regards to Jesus' return for his church. And Jesus said it himself, Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39. But as for the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will, be, uh, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what we should do is take what Jesus says and look back and kind of discern what it looked like during these, this time of Noah. Okay, verse one says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. The first thing that we want to note that is a mark, a characteristic of Noah's day is uh, there was an overpopulation. There was a population explosion. Many scholars believe that there's somewhere between six to seven million people on the earth right now at this time, verse one. Verse 2 says, And the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And so the second thing was there was this widespread sexual immorality linked also with brutality. They took, it says. And it's indicating that they took these women actually by force against their will. It was, it's indicating a forcefulness. They took wives multiple. It wasn't just one man, one woman. It's just, um, you know, guys took many women of whom they chose. They took these girls to be their property. Uh, so the first is, is overpopulation. Second is widespread. Second uh, characteristic, widespread sexual immorality with brutality. And then third verse, it says, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, the idea between this 120 years is not that 
God is shortening the lifespan of man. It's not going from 900 years to 120 years to our three score and 10 years. That's not what's going on here. The idea here is God is giving um, mankind 120 years to repent before he pronounces judgment. He's giving people a chance to turn from their sins and, and turn to him and repent. God is saying that there's coming a time when he's going to bring judgment. He's done it in the past. And you know, we'd be foolish to think that it's not coming in our time, that he won't do it again. The Bible very clearly tells us that there is a judgment that's coming. 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7, if you can turn there very quickly, 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7, it says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning, beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You know, the New Testament very clearly teaches that there is a judgment that is coming. And this is a warning to anyone who's not walking with the Lord. If you're not saved today, it would be foolish to think that God's not going to judge because you don't see it out there on the horizon. You know, the Lord would have us wake up. You know, if you're not walking with the Lord, he's, he's crying out to you, wake up. Jesus said that his return would be like a thief coming in the night. You're not going to know when it's going to happen. It's going to take you by surprise if you're not ready. And if you continue to reject the work of the Holy Spirit, which the work of the Holy Spirit is pointing you and leading you to Jesus, if you continue to reject the work of the Holy Spirit, Every time you say no to him, when you hear the gospel being preached, you know, there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit will stop working with you. He'll stop uh, working on your heart. And rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit, that's what's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's his job, again, is to point you to Jesus Christ. If you reject that, a lifelong rejection of Jesus Christ, that's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. And Jesus says there's no forgiveness for that. There's no second chances for that. If you're willing to reject the free gift of salvation, then you'll stand before a holy God and you'll suffer his wrath. You've crossed the line and there's no turning back. And that's just exactly what we're reading about here in Genesis. Verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth and that every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continually. So the third uh, characteristic, the third mark of uh, Noah's generation and the time on the earth at that time was wickedness. It was rampant. I mean, wickedness was widespread. And notice even in verse 5, right? So you can circle it in your Bible, circle it in your mind at the very least. Notice every, only, and continually, right? It says that every intent of the thoughts of uh, his heart was only evil continually. Now, verse 11, we're going to get to it, but verse 11 says that the world was filled with violence. And Jesus said that, you know, during this time, all this is going on, people are just eating and drinking. You know, they're partying, they're marrying, getting married, everything's rosy. Uh, they thought everything was okay. They didn't see anything wrong around them, or at least... They ignored it when they saw it. And then judgment fell. And I ask you, boy, are these four characteristics not the characteristics that mark our generation today? I mean, 
uh, overcrowding and overpopulation, the population explosion. You know, it's interesting because I was uh, preaching just, you know, a few months ago when I came up here, I think it was like, boy, I think it was like in November, maybe a little bit before. But at that time, there was estimated to be 7.5 billion people in the world. Right now, I looked it up. It's estimated that there's 7.8 billion people in the world. As of May 2020, the population of the world, it took up to 1,800 before the population of the world, after the flood, of course, got to be 1 billion people. 127 years after that, it doubled to 2 billion people. But then it only took 47 years for it to double again to 4 billion people. And right now, since 1960, the world population is growing by about a billion people every 13 years. And again, this is sobering. And, and um, you know, I want this to be on the forefront of our minds and our hearts as a church. 7.8 billion people in the world today. And it's estimated that 42% of them have never heard the name of Jesus. They have no access to a Bible. There's no access to a Christian that can tell them about the plan of salvation. That's 3,276,000,000 people right now that have no hope of salvation. Should they die today, they would go straight to hell because they've never heard about Jesus. Boy, I pray that that weighs heavy on our hearts as a church. But the second... Um, Characteristic was widespread sexual immoralities. And I'll tell you, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I did a lot of research uh, for this Bible study. And you know what? This morning I had to scrap it because you know, it was just so depressing. So depressing to talk about teen pregnancy and human trafficking. You know, there's sex tourism, pornography. You know, the average age of a person that's introduced to pornography, hardcore pornography, average age, conservatively, 13 years old. Some people think that the first introduction of hardcore pornography, eight years old. I mean, widespread celebrated sexual immorality, homosexuality. I mean, it is just crazy. Friends with benefits. Yeah, I don't want to go into it. The third characteristic, widespread wickedness and and again, I don't want to go into it, but man, turn the TV on. Turn the TV on. Try to find a, a TV show that's wholesome, something that you know um, highlights noble family values, something that's edifying. You know, uh, it's not. They're not out there. TV shows. They're not teaching virtue anymore. They're not teaching honesty anymore. You know, I was thinking about this, and I remember when I was a kid. Um, Watching Dragnet. You remember Dragnet? Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am. Nothing but the facts. So help me God, whatever he would say. I don't know. But we went from Dragnet. We went from Joe Friday to Dexter. I mean, Dexter's, he's a criminal and he's a cop. I mean, all these cop shows, bad boys, shades of blue. I mean, the cops are just as bad as the bad people. It's hard to find a program that doesn't have <clears throat> two men or two women kissing, that they don't portray... Um, homosexuality is just a normal lifestyle, right? Turn on the radio. I was, I was driving back to the church office the other day uh, from a meeting, and I was listening to ESPN and sports radio, and I had to turn it off because they're glorifying drug abuse. And I'm not talking about PEDs. They're talking about cocaine, and they're laughing and cracking jokes, and boy, you know, it's so awesome. And I, Movies today. Man, you know, the movies are constantly pushing the boundaries. They're constantly throwing in profanity. They're constantly fighting against ratings, trying to get more into a movie. You know, try to find a decent PG movie. You know, PG-13, and somebody's going to drop an F-bomb. And they, they're coming up with all these scenarios of how to kill people, like crazier and weirder, and, and how to abuse people and abduct, abduct people, and then killing and... You know, it's just widespread, the violence, you know. I can't even go into the violence. I was looking into it about, you know, the percentage of violent crimes in America. And, you know, it's just shocking. It's just shocking. 
You know, all the time, people all around us are eating, they're drinking, they're partying, you know, everything's good, you know, everything's okay. They don't see anything around them that's, that's wrong. At least if they do, they're ignoring it. It says there that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the intent of, of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And this passage reminds us that God looks upon the heart. He sees your heart. And I just ask, is your heart soft towards God today? You know, is your heart uh, after the Lord? Is your heart, are you running after the Lord in your heart today? Are you drawing close to him in your heart today? Or is your heart hard towards God? And, and I'm not talking just to unbelievers right here. You know, throughout the, the Gospels, we read about how the, the apostles, they're walking with Christ. And believe it or not, Jesus rebukes them multiple times for having hard hearts. You know, why do they have hard hearts? Well, they fail to believe. They fail to understand. They fail to remember all the things that God was doing around them and through them and with them, all the things that Jesus was demonstrating them, they, they, they didn't embrace it. All that Jesus had done in their lives before their eyes, all that, that, they, that they saw, and still they allowed doubt to creep into their hearts and it made them hard. You know, how, how that can can happen in our hearts if we're not watchful, if we're not careful, if we're not mindful. You know, how often do we, do we pray prayers? How often do we, do we offer up a prayer? And you know, in reality, if we were honest, we don't even believe God's gonna answer it. They're just words. You know, I just tell you, it's true in, in my life often. You know, I'll pray something and I'll just like have to stop and just, God, forgive me. I mean, there's no passion there. There's no fire there in the prayer. You know, Lord, I'm just saying something. It's just, it's, it's just a ritual. And boy, we have to guard against that. We have to guard against that. There are circumstances that if we get our eyes on the circumstances, it will overshadow our relationship with the Lord and it will cause our hearts to be hard. It says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man. And again, this just kind of strikes me real quick. Uh, the last time we saw that the Lord saw was Genesis 131. And it said, God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And again, how far has man fallen? How far have we fallen today? The wickedness all around us. You know what? We've gotten hard to it. We don't even, we don't even, it doesn't even bother us anymore. Like I said, we watch these programs, there's sexual immorality, there's all kinds of things going on in the programs. You know, we don't even think about it. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I mean, those are older movies, I don't know who is an action movie now because I haven't seen a movie in a long time, but you know, I mean, remember that movie, True Lies? I mean, I think it's within the first 10 minutes of the movie, first 30 minutes for sure, he kills like 50 people. Yeah, you know what, it's entertainment. We don't even think about it. We watch programs and movies where people are being abused and, and, you know, kidnappings and all kinds of stuff. And you know what? I'm not condemning anybody. I'm saying, I'm preaching to myself here. It doesn't, it doesn't even phase us. We're, we've gotten so hard to these things. So I think that the purpose of this story here in Genesis 6 is to get us to wake up, to wake up. Paul says in Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Boy, you know, we're closer. Our salvation is closer than when we first began. Boy, what great news that is. Let's, let's you know, put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. 
Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. God created man to walk with him in the cool of the day. God created man to commune with him, to fellowship with him. And this is what man has brought things to. God was sorry. Man made God sorry that he ever created him. And the description given to us here says that God was grieved in his heart. The idea behind the Hebrew is that it cut the Lord to his heart. I mean, it just cut deep. You know, you grieve when something happens to somebody you're in love with, somebody you're, you're just deeply in love with. You know, you go out today, you read an obituary, you read, you know, 10, 20 people, they died. Hey, they were survived by a wife, a couple kids. Ah, okay, whatever. Because there's no relationship there. There's, there's no, no intimacy there. You know, but boy, somebody that you do love, somebody close to home, someone close to your family, a best friend, when they die, you know, just even though that they were Christians and they're going to be with the Lord, there's just a grieving there. And don't you know, you know, that this God of love, that loves man, I mean, how bad does it have to be that he's willing to pass judgment? Don't you know that God's heart is grieving over the wickedness in the world today? Don't you know that God's heart is broken over the state of the world that we live in, over the state of our, our town here in Truckee and the surrounding area? All the wickedness that God sees. And here's the thing we don't often think about. Not only all the wickedness that he sees, he sees all the wickedness. He sees it all and it grieves the Lord today. And that's why if you're not a believer today, God's heart is breaking for you. He is longing for you to run to him so that he can cleanse you and forgive you of your sins. Calvary Chapel family, he wants us to wake up and choose the fear of the Lord and to run after him with all of our hearts. Verse seven, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've made them. Now, God is just not trying to wipe out wickedness here. He's not just sending judgment because everybody's bad. He's actually taking steps to preserve his promise of a savior. At this point in time, there's only eight righteous people. Noah, his wife, three boys, and their, and their wives. There's only eight righteous people. And in one wild night, they could all be wiped out. Then what, then what is God going to do? Then how is God going to bring a Savior into the world? You know, he's going to bring a Savior in the world through this line of Seth, through the promise, right? God has to judge. Not only is his judgment just and deserved, but he's also protecting his plan of salvation. You know, like I said, there's been 18, 18, uh, 1,600 years uh, since Adam and Eve. And we've read back there in chapter 5, we read it repeatedly, and he died, and he died, and he died. We read it over and over again. And those people that died in faith looking for a Messiah, they're waiting for a Savior also. And God's going to protect that promise of his. Throughout the Old Testament, we're going to read about it. It's going to be a great study, a great thread throughout, especially the first five books of the Bible, just how God preserves his promise of a Messiah. Verse 8, but, great contrast, every time you see but, eh, mostly every time you see but, it's a contrasting word. It's contrasting the previous with the current now. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the first mention of grace in the Bible. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You want to know what the good thing is? If you're saved, you found grace in the eyes of the Lord too. If you're a believer, you found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, it's such a, a great thing to understand because the only way anyone can be saved or has been saved is through the grace of our God. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. And if you're not saved today, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want you to know that God has grace for you too. 
If you'll look to Jesus, if you'll turn from your sins, if you'll run to Jesus, confess your sins, you'll find grace. You know what he wants you to do is he just wants you to look deep in his eyes of grace and let him love you. That's the God that we serve. He's gracious. Noah discovered God's grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you can too. You just need to look up. You just need to humble yourself and look up. And you can receive God's unconditional love, unconditional favor. He'll respond to you if you'll respond to him. Verse 9 says this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. When it says that he was a just man, it means that he knew right and wrong uh, in the sight of God, and he was obedient to that revelation. He, he, he just walked with God, right? When it says that he was perfect in his generations, it means that he was blameless, not that he was sinless. It means that he was blameless. The words uh, translated perfect here in the Hebrew is tamin, T-A-M-I-N. And it's the word that's used throughout the Old Testament for the sacrifices. And it means that they were spotless, that they were uh, without blemish. The opposite of tamin is where we get our English word contaminated. That's the opposite of tamin. It doesn't mean that he was without sin. It means that he had a good testimony to those uh, amongst those who are on the outside. Nobody could point a finger at Noah and bring some accusation of, of um, you know, doing wrong. And it says that Noah walked with God again. This is the second person that we read about in the Bible that it says he walked with God. And we talked about Enoch. He was the first one. We, uh, we talked about Enoch's walk with God. And you know, Noah was the grandson of Methuselah. And uh, you know that Methuselah and Lamech, Noah's, uh, Noah's dad, spoke to him about Enoch. In fact, Adam, again, he was all the way up to 50, 55 years into, uh, I think it was 55 years before Noah uh, was born born, I don't know, check me on that, whatever I said a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, Adam was around through Methuselah, right? And, and uh, so you know that, man, they were just pouring into Noah. They were talking about Enoch and the blessings that came from walking with the Lord. And the result of all of that pouring into Noah was that Noah walked with the Lord. And how that's encouraging to me, how important it is for us as parents and grandparents to pour into our kids and our grandkids. And the encouragement here is this. If you have kids that aren't walking with the Lord, you know what? You walk with the Lord. You walk with the Lord in such a way that it affects them, that they would see your walk and it would affect them. You know, you can have a walk with God even though the whole world is going the wrong way. And this is encouragement to young believers here too. Noah, he stood up for what was right in, in the eyes of the Lord. And you can too. You can obey God even if you're the only person in the whole world that's going to obey God. God has given each Christian the Holy Spirit. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling us that gives us the power to be obedient to God and to be obedient to his word. You know, and that's something that Noah didn't have. He didn't have the Holy Spirit like we had. He didn't, we talked about this in regards to Enoch too. He didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have that to rely on. The Holy Spirit wasn't living in his heart the way he's living in our lives. And God's Spirit gives us the power. And if we're trying to do it in our, in our own strength, it's going to fail. It's not going to happen. And you need to know that the world gets more and more wicked as the world gets more and more wicked you're still able to walk with God. You don't have to be like everyone else. No matter how evil this world gets, but it takes a walk with God. It takes more than just this head knowledge of, of God and who God is. It takes a walk committed to obedience, committed to um, the word of God, given over to the word of God, committed to a life of, 
of communication with God. We call it prayer. You got to be talking to God. You know what? We read the Bible. That's God talking to us. We pray to him. That's us talking to him. And we have this communication going on with God. And you know, it's not hard to have that type of life. It just takes want to. You have to want to do it. You know, you have to want to live that life. You have to want to have a life walking with God. Now, the idea of walking, I mean, it's typically uh, one of the first things you learn in life, right? After no, probably. Uh, you know, it's just walking. It's taking one step at a time. It's just right foot and then the left foot. And that's the way it is walking with God. It's one step of faith at a time. You know, it's one act of obedience at a time. Hebrews eleven seven 7 gives us further insight into Noah's life. It says, by faith, Noah, and you might want to turn here, okay? We're going to look at this verse, Hebrews eleven seven. 7. It says, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark, an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. And one of the things that just strikes me right off the bat, it's the only description of, of a man or a woman in that hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, the description of his life that it begins with faith and it ends with faith. You know, so... Let's take a quick look at what Noah's faith looked like. He was grounded in the word. That's the first thing we know, right? He was divinely warned. He was warned by God of coming judgment. He believed God's word. He believed God when he spoke of things that were unseen. It says, being divinely warned of things not seen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us that we walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. Noah he also reverenced God. It says he was moved with godly fear. And the evidence of his faith was that he built an ark. James 2, 7 says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. People are to see our faith through our works, through our walks, and through our witness. And you can't have faith for others but Noah had faith that influenced others. It says Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his household. You know, Noah's faith was seen by his family and they believed and they were saved. And we see that throughout the Bible. We see Rahab, how, how her faith affected the salvation of her family. The Philippian jailer and the promise of, of Paul, hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. I can't have believe in Christ for salvation for them, but as I believe in Christ and I live my life for him, that affects them. You know, the witness of, of um, you know, again, if you have kids that just aren't walking with the Lord, run for Jesus. That's the, that's the encouragement. Run for Jesus in your faith. It's going to affect them. The witness of Noah's faith, it condemned the world. It said, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world. Philippians 1, 27, uh, sorry, Philippians 1, 27 and 28 says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or, or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition. You know, our faith, not being terrified, that's, a, that's condemning to them. But to you, he goes on to say, but to you of salvation and that from God. You know, our faith is condemning to others, but you know, our faith is a sign of salvation. We're the light of the world and our light exposes the darkness and the world hates it. Don't make any mistakes about it. And Noah had a reward for his faith. He says he became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Faith brings immediate blessing into our lives, right? God's eyes are upon us when we exercise faith. Faith brings peace into our heart and it also makes all things possible. It also carries the promise of future blessings as we're 
co-heirs of Christ in all things. Genesis uh, 6, verses 10 through 16 now. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also was very corrupt, and the earth was filled with violence. That was the fourth characteristic. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from, uh, I'll destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, its height 30 cubits. And you shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower second and third decks. So we want to look at this real quick. Um, Verse 14 Uh, God tells Noah to make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Now, we don't actually know what gopher wood is. Um, Most scholars think it's cypress wood. I mean, the beautiful thing about uh, wood is it's a common material and it's readily available. And if we see the ark as a picture of salvation, and it is, you know what? It's readily available, you know? It's available to anybody who wants to be saved. And it says, God tells Noah, and cover it inside and out with pitch. Why would it be covered in pitch? Hmm, that's kind of interesting. Uh, The Hebrew word that's translated pitch here is uh, kapfar, K-A-P-H-A-R. Every other place this word is seen in the Old Testament, it's translated atonement. And this is, Atonement, uh, this covering of a pitch, that's what you know the Old Testament sacrifices were all about. There's atonement, there's a covering of pitch and the ark, and it was to be done inside out. And Jesus, with Jesus, in Jesus, there is atonement. Somebody said atonement is at one mint. I think it's an easy way to, to say it. But the idea is there's forgiveness. And it, complete and it starts from our inside and our hearts and it works its way on the outside he says to make rooms in the ark every other place this word translated rooms here it's translated actually nest it's kind of interesting um it's the the ark is a picture of salvation and jesus as i said and noah I was told to make rooms in the ark. And it reminds me of John chapter 14, where Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You know, there's a prepared place for all of us. There's room in Christ to escape the coming judgment. Verse 15, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the width 50 cubits, and the height 30 cubits. And now the cubit, uh, it was the distance between, from the elbow to the middle finger. That's what they use as a measuring rod. You know, if you were selling something, you wanted to have a small arm. You know, you sold it by the cubit. If you were buying something, you wanted to have a big arm, whatever. But it's interesting that that 18 inches on average, this arc is 450 feet by 75 feet by 45 feet, right? It's just big box basically but what's interesting are the dimensions are what's called in our day nautically perfect it's a six to one ratio um, a lot of our military ships are built close to a 61 six to one ratio ship uh, uh, ratio and they're a little bit bigger than a six to one but you know cruise liners are built at a six to one ratio the ark is built this way the ark is built this way and, you know, there, there are, um, I don't know what they call them, shipwrights, I guess, people that figure out ship stuff. You know, they say that these dimensions make the ark, it would make it almost impossible to capsize. Someone figured it out that the ark would be able to go up a va- the face, a vertical face of a 90-foot wave and come back down without capsizing. I mean, it's pretty interesting. And you know what's also interesting? Somebody figured this out. It would have a 22-foot draft. 
That doesn't mean anything to me. It just means that the bottom of the boat is 22 feet below the, the water. And then we see in Genesis 7, 20, that waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. That's 22 and a half feet covering the top of the mountains. You know, so the ark's not going to run aground. I, I, I find that kind of interesting. And by the way, you know, 22 and a half feet over the top of the mountains, it was a global flood. That's what it's being talked about here. Verse 16, you shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, third decks. So it would appear that there was a space um, 18 inches from the top, you know, and that's a window. Uh, some people think it's a window. Some people think it's just... Um, you know, it runs along the side of the ark, 18 inches from the top, this window. Maybe there's an overhang, you know. It was probably for ventilation. You have an ark full of animals. I mean, you're going to want ventilation, I guess. Um, you get in a barn full of animals, you want ventilation, right? Well, you know, what's interesting to me, to me is that with that window in that position, Noah's not able to see the stuff that's going around you know, the storm. He's not able to actually see it, right? He couldn't see the storm. He couldn't see the waves, right? The only way Noah and his family could look out of the ark was to look up. You know, how interesting is that? In the midst of our storms of life, you know what? We need to look up. Noah did. In the midst of his storm, he had to look up. We need to remember, you know, when there are storms in our life, when we're really going through it, when things are stinky and, you know, you just feel like you need a breath of fresh air, look up. That's the encouragement for us. And it says, God tells Noah, set a, a door on this, the, uh, set the door of the ark in its side. It's another picture of Jesus and salvation. There's only one door. There's only one door. And in comparison, it's a narrow door. You know, there's only one way to get into the ark and be saved, you know. But anyone could get into the ark and be saved if they wanted to repent. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way into salvation. And it also goes on to say, and this is really interesting to me, uh, and I know I'm going long. Please uh, be patient with me, okay? We're going to get through it real quick. Uh, you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Interesting. The ark is three in one, right? It's a, it's a picture of how each member of the Godhead is involved in our salvation. You know, Peter, he writes of this combined work of salvation, 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The Godhead, each member of the Trinity is engaged, involved in the work of salvation. And by the way, 1 Peter 1, 2, it's the Trinity found in one verse. As I said, those are things that I know. Verse 17 and 18. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life, Everything that's on the earth shall die. So again, it's a global flood. You know what? Wicked people aren't stupid. If this was a local flood, they'd just pick up stakes and move to the next village. They'd go find some high, high uh, ground to be spared. But no, this is a global flood. And there's evidence of a global flood. I mean, you can get into, you know, finding seashells there in the Himalayas. You can get into finding, you know, intact mammals, you know, at the very lowest part of our, of our earth. So... Uh, verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wife with you. And here's the first time the word covenant is used in the Bible. We won't go into it because uh, we're running out of time. Verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds after their kinds of animal after animals after their kind and of creeping things on the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. 
And Noah didn't have to go out and trap all these animals and, you know, rope them and hog tie them, whatever, you know, you do with animals, I don't know, and bring them into the ark. God brought the animals to Noah. And, you know, to me, it's just such a picture. You know, it's just such a, it's such a wonderful picture to me. It's so comforting to me. God calls us to a work, right? He calls us to do something for them, for him. And then he gives us the ability to do it. And then after he gives us the ability to do it, what does he do? He does it. You know, I'm so thankful for that. As he's, as he's called me here to lead this church, you know, I, apart from God, I can't do it. It's not within me. And so I come relying on God. And you know what? He's going to do the work in our body. He's going to bring blessing to our church. Like I said, it's never been seen before in the history of this church. There's new things ahead of us, great things, and we're to be encouraged. He never calls us to do something that we can't do unless we try to do it without him, right? So verse 21, And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for uh, them. The ark, you know, it has plenty of room for every kind of animal. You know, uh, one pair per species. We're going to find out later. Clean animals, you bring seven of those, but of the unclean, one, one set. You know, uh, you don't have to bring, you know, every kind of dog. You know, just two will do. And from those two, the vari- uh, diversity and variety comes a- apart uh, across from the species. You know, I was watching, Tina and I were watching this B- BBC program about dogs. And it was interesting. They said, you know what? All dogs, 98% of the DNA of all dogs is basically wolf, right? All dogs came from wolves, and they share the same DNA, 98% worth. Uh, It's the 2% that makes the Chihuahua, makes the Basset Hound, makes the Great Dane. Uh, But you know what? Uh, You just bring one set, and then that variety occurs after that. And Noah, you know, he's not a dumb guy. God brings the animal. Uh, God would bring the little animals to Noah, right? You don't bring a full-grown elephant to Noah. One, they may die before they're able to reproduce. You bring the little elephant, they take up less space, they're able to reproduce, they have a longer life to be able to reproduce. Someone figured out that the ark would have the interior volume, if this means anything to anybody. doesn't mean a lot to me, but it's 1,400,000 cubic feet. I don't know how big that is. One million of anything's got to be a lot. So they said it's equivalent to 522 railroad cars. Well, that's got to be a lot too. I don't know. It's estimated that there are 18,000 species on the earth today. If we were to double that to 36,000, to take into account that half of every animal um, has gone extinct, right? That would be 75,000 animals. animals in the ark. The average size of the animal being a sheep, right? You got a baby elephant on one side, you got a mouse on the other side. You average them out, they're about a sheep size. You know what? There would be enough room for 150,000 sheep. What shepherd doesn't want 150,000 sheep? I don't know. Um, But you know, even with that, the ark would only be 60% capacity in regards to animals. 40% 40% would be for food storage uh, with those figurings. So verse 22, Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. Notice that. How beautiful is this? Noah did all did. Again, circle those words. He was obedient in every detail. You know, what if he made the, the ark half the size that God commanded him to make it? What if he only made it with one deck instead of three? You know, the outcome would be uh, wildly different than what we see now. How important is it to be obedient to God in every detail? Every detail of our life, just to surrender to him. And you know what? Just in closing, again, I I know I've gone a little bit long. I think I've gone a little bit long. I just want to thank you for your patience. But just in closing, what does it take to survive in our wicked world today. You know, it takes a walk with God. You know, a serious, committed, obedient walk with God. 
where we're taking steps of faith, where we're just following him, we're communing with him, we're drawing close to him, we're praying, we're reading, we're learning of him. Second, I already said it, it's an obedient walk. We need to be obedient to God's word, even if no one else is obeying. No one else in your family, nobody else at work, nobody else at school. You know what? Even if no one else in the world is, obe- uh, uh, is obedient to God, it's not an excuse for us. It's not an excuse that has no effect on us what other people do. The question is, who do you say I am? That's what Jesus asked his disciples. Hey, you know, people say this, people say that. Yeah, okay, great. Who do you say that I am? You know, not only do we need a walk with God, an obedient walk with God, but you know what? When judgment does come, we need to be found by God doing uh, what it is that he's commanded us to do, just like Noah. He built that ark. 120 years, he was working on that ark. You know, you know, people are ridiculing him. People are making jokes about him. Hey, man, how many Noahs does it take to change a light bulb? You know, whatever the case may be. You know what? They're just making fun of him. You know, ah, you know what? We're going to die before he finishes that thing. Whatever. But you know what? Noah is listed in this hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And his life is characterized by faith. Now that's what I want in my life. I want to please God. And the only way to please God is to exercise faith. You know what? If you're not a believer today, there's salvation in Jesus Christ. He is the only way. And there's no exclusion. Um, There's no, you know, nothing that you've done that can keep you from salvation. There's only what you're willing to do that will gain salvation. And that's to bow your knees before a holy God, confess your sin, and ask Him to forgive you, to ask Him to come into your heart and give you the power to live by Him. Everyone can be saved. We just have to come to Him confessing our sins and ready to receive forgiveness. Let's pray. Father God, I just I thank you for the study. Lord, there's so much in this chapter. Lord, it's so hard for me to just, yeah, breeze through it, Lord, without going deeper. But Lord, I, I just pray. God, would you minister to our hearts? God, would you, would you just speak to us, Lord? Would you challenge us to live for you? Would you challenge us to be obedient to you, to be a witness for you at home, at work, in school, wherever we go, Lord? I pray people would see our faith, our faith through our works, through our walk, through our witness, Lord. And for those that maybe don't know you, Lord, would you just give them the courage to surrender now, and just ask you to come into their to their heart, forgive them of their for to ask you to forgive them of their sins, Lord. I love you, Lord Jesus. I praise you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the edification and instruction we receive from studying your word, God. We give you glory. In your name, we pray. Amen. Hey, if uh, you just gave your heart to Jesus Christ, call the office. Let us know. Let us get a Bible in your hand. Let's talk. Let's, we don't want anything from you. Just want to help you with your walk with the Lord, just growing deeper with him. If you want to uh, sign up to volunteer to help out um, when we start meeting in the park, probably in a few weeks, we'll see. But please get a hold of the church and let us know, okay? All right, thanks a lot. God bless you guys. I'm praying for you. Love you. Have a great night.